Good morning. You thought it was, didn't you? <laughs> I am uh, honored to be here. I'm uh, grateful to have been asked by Lee Mason to come and speak. First thing I thought when I hung the phone up was, why me? And uh, I just appreciate the opportunity. And also, uh, I am a product of Summit Theological Seminary. I've also directed other young men, especially those like myself who are in the workforce. Uh, that's a good place to go to learn the Bible, if you want to learn the Bible. And um, one of the things I learned from George uh, was the importance of understanding the Old Testament, how it connects to the New Testament. And, uh, and I found more and more of my preaching over the years has done just that. So I, uh, I really appreciate you, George, and the way that you preach your sermons. He's a wise man, and he's a man who's been here for a long time. He was on the first team uh, writing the first uh, edition of the King James Version, and so that's why he's so well-versed in it. But he's also a friend and a counselor and a number of other things, and so I'm very appreciative. I uh, have to say to you that I'm the, one of the unknown Joneses there Two of my brothers preach. Most, how many of you know David, my brother, David Jones? Boy, all of us in the same boat. We all know him. And then Gary he also preaches. And Eddie Jones, uh, listening to Art sing, my dad thought the world of Art. And, uh, I mean, a, just a, a man that really touched him in, in so many ways. And so when I hear you, see you, I think of uh, how much you met in my dad's life. Uh, the reality is I'm not exactly sure how it came about. Word got out to me that uh, Lee met with the committee and said, uh, well, we want to have someone come preach on the, on, uh, the principles of leadership, biblical leadership. And uh, let, let's get one of the Joneses uh, from uh, out in Virginia, out there in Mechanicsville area and Richmond area. And uh, so that's what the team decided they would do. And they, so they put the criteria down as a very spiritual-minded leader. And so they made the phone call, and when the answer was no, uh, they went back and said, okay, let's uh, have uh, another criteria, a very hard-working leader. When the answer was no, they came back a third time and said, let's just get the best-looking one, and I'm glad to be here today. <laughs> uh, after all, it's hard to say no three times in a row. So... Uh, There is a leadership crisis in America today. Would you agree with me? And that crisis is uh, very evident in the political realm. It's also evident in education. It's evident in uh, uh, local governments. And across the board, there is a leadership crisis in America. I want to share some words that were written about leadership from a book uh, that was simply named Leadership. Now, it wasn't for the church. It was for the corporate world, and this is what uh, uh, Mr. Burns, uh, McGregor Burns, wrote. He said, I will identify two basic types of leadership, the transactional and the transforming. The relations of most leaders and followers are transactional. Leaders approach followers with an eye to exchanging one thing for another, jobs for votes, or subsidies for campaign contributions, such transactions compromise the bulk of the relationships between leaders and followers, especially in groups, legislatures, and parties. Transforming leadership, while more complex, is more potent. The transforming leader recognizes and exploits an existing need or demand of a potential follower. But beyond that, the transforming leader looks for potential motives in followers, seeks to satisfy, satisfy higher needs, and engages the full person of the follower. The result of transforming leadership is a relationship of mutual stimulation and elevation that, con that converts followers into leaders and may convert leaders into moral agents. Now, that was written in 1978 for the corporate world. But there's something here that speaks to leaders in the church today. And my presentation today is based on this, and that is that biblical leadership is a transforming style of leadership. And as 
and by the way, my focus will be on uh, the elders. And uh, how many elders do we have here today? It's probably not going to be very many. We've got well, more than I thought. Great. Uh, how many of you are preachers, uh, evangelists out here today? Okay, quite a few. So the principles that I hope to put forth t- today really do touch uh, the, uh, primarily the elders, but you preachers go home and teach <laughs> the elders some of these principles and, um, and identify some of the problems. What are they? We have t- too many unqualified elders. Now, I'm saying this in love. I've been an elder, so I think I get to say it, and I have been an unqual- unqualified, not biblically. I, I'm talking about unqualified in other ways. And by the way, I'm not talking today about biblical qualifications. I am a strong advocate for what's being taught in the Scriptures. We go through a vetting process that we're not just looking for the most popular person, but we're looking for the man that's biblically qualified to serve as an elder who has that desire in his heart. But the problem is that we have elders out here who are too busy managing rather than shepherding and leading in the church the way they ought to. We are reacting more than we are proactively planning and and helping with vision and shepherding those around us. The results are churches are splitting. They are being divided. And I appreciated the the introduction. I was at Gethsemane for 16 years. Uh, Following that, I was at Paul Green for an interim of 13 months. And now I'm doing seminars. And uh, my favorite (laughs) happens to be how to study the book of Revelation and Christ, uh, the Gospels, and discipleship, but the one I'm being asked to do more and more is the one I didn't advertise, and that is come speak to us about leadership. I really didn't want to speak about it because after 10 years as an elder and 16 as a preaching minister, I'd had enough. But I'm saddened as I move about and preach and talk to the church leaders or people who are desperate, wringing their hands because many of our churches are actually wondering if they should close the doors or not. And I know of churches in the Virginia area that not only has that been a question for some of those churches, many of them have only been able to keep the doors open because someone with denominational connections has come along to take over the church. And I can name the churches that that's happened. That one was an Assembly of God person came in and, uh, and worked his way into the church and took over. That church has since split again, and they're wondering again, how can we keep our doors open? We need biblical transformational leadership. We're also living in a, uh, it's harder today, I think. Now, every generation probably says it's harder, but we're living in a global world. We're living in a pluralistic society, and you say, well, every society has been pluralistic. Let me tell you, compare Ma and Pa grocery store to what we have now when we walk in a grocery store. Multiple choices, it's almost too confusing. And pluralism, false teaching and false religion is prevalent in our land, and it's getting worse day by day. That's why I appreciate what George said, and I really appreciated what he said about Uh, from the book of Ephesians about unity. I believe, too, with all my heart that we do not create unity, but we're called as leaders to help maintain the unity in the church. There's a little word in the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Ezekiel 37, 7, when Ezekiel had that vision, and uh, God told him to preach uh, the word to those the valley of dry bones. And uh, in verse 37, uh, it's the word is hominian, the Greek word. I think it's very interesting, George, that that word, hominian, is never used anywhere else in the New Testament other than in Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 16, excuse me, 21, and chapter 4 in verse 16, where it's talking about the harmony and the unity of the body in one reference to a temple and another to the one body that George was talking about, harmony. The harmony, the coming, to, the union, the joining of the bones with the sinews, the flesh into the body was done by the Spirit of God. Read Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37, and then read Ezekiel 37, the second uh, vision or par- uh, parable that was to be demonstrated by Ezekiel when he took the two sticks and wrote Ephraim in the northern kingdom on one and Judah and the southern on the other and put them together. God is the one who makes us one new man in Christ. Amen? It's God that does that. Transformational leadership uh, 
is a, a leadership that approaches, that looks at difficulties in the church or potential problems in the church with this consideration. How can we approach this difficulty as an elder, preacher working with the elders, leader in the church? How can we approach this that also has an emphasis on personal growth for the people involved or the potential people involved in the, in the problem? Transforming leadership stresses, stresses the importance of relationships in church. Brothers and sisters, most of our churches really do fail when it comes to functioning the way we ought to function, but functionality takes second place to relationships. We first need to build upon relationships, and we need to do it in the right way. And third, transforming leadership must be grounded in sound biblical doctrine. Now, Thinking about that, I, I want you to uh, consider 1 Corinthians in chapter 8. Uh, I'm not going to stay in this text long, but it's an illustration. Paul was a transforming leader. And maybe I should stop now to say that inner transformation is the work of God in the Spirit inside the individual. Amen? It comes through taking in the Word and then applying the Word and living the Word. So I can't go out and transform you, and you can't transform me. As a matter of fact, God won't transform you unless you're open and submissive to His will and you stay in His Word. So a transforming leader understands Word of God, transformation, the individual, uh, and so forth. So when Paul had a problem in Corinth that he uh, identified, he writes in verse 1 of chapter 8, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up. But love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as the eating of the food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there are... are may be so-called gods in heaven on earth. Indeed, there are many <clears throat> gods and many lords. Yet for us, there is one God and Father from whom all things uh, and for whom we exist and one Lord at Jesus Christ through whom all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Now, this text is not talking about weak and strong. It's talking about the weak, and the assumption is the stronger and faith understand. In Romans, Paul specifically says the weak and the strong. But here he's pointing to the weak brother, the sister, who has misunderstood or been involved in eating the meats offered to uh, uh, the false gods, which is idolatry. They were sinners. They did, uh, now they know better, but their conscience is, uh, is still weak. And a conscience has to be informed. A conscience has to be filled by the Word of God in order for, a con for us to make conscientious decisions that are properly made, uh, whether we're a leader or in our own personal lives. And so these folk were still filling the conscience with the information of God, still being taught the Word of God, but some of them were still weak in the faith. And so they would have misunderstood how someone who had been a Christian, who did not think that they were eating meat, offering it that had been offered to a real God of any sort, they could be confused. My point here is not to do an exposition of the text, but to say that Paul saw the problem, and Paul was concerned with two groups of people, those who are weaker, who are growing in the faith, and those who are the mature in the faith. Now, that's transformational leadership. Paul identifies the problem, and then after describing it, he prescribes the solution. And it's founded in the Word of God because you know what he does here? He says there is only one God who made all things, the doctrine of the one God, the doctrine of creation, the doctrine of the Lordship of Christ. All of this is brought together. Leaders, we need to address every situation in the church 
with an eye to growth of the individual, growth of the congregation, and we need to make our decisions and do our teaching in the sound teaching, the doctrine of the Word of God. Amen? Paul did that in 1 Corinthians. And uh, when he began the, the book with a divisiveness, and he used the doctrine of the cross. And he ends, well, in the middle of the book, in chapters 10 and 11, he deals with disunity around the Lord's table. Chapter 12, Paul is dealing with misuse of the spiritual gifts, doctrine. And in chapter 15, they didn't understand bodily resurrection, doctrine of the resurrection of Christ. And so, leaders, you want to be transforming? Stay in the Word. My point uh, in the few minutes that I have here is that to be a transformational leader, we need to first of all know God personally. Stay in His Word. When you stay in His Word, you develop conviction and courage to lead. Number two, know yourself. And that means uh, understand that God wants me to see myself through His eyes, not through my own eyes. He wants me to look at my life through his eyes, the mirror that I stand in front. He wants it to be shaped, and he wants me to permeate with my thoughts, with his word and his will. He wants to be changing me so I see myself differently. Leaders, we need to look at ourselves the way that God looks at us. And third, we also need to know the people. Jesus knew his flock. And, and uh, I, if I have time, I want to advocate what that means in the practical real world of doing leadership. I think Roger Chambers used to call preaching, the preaching ministry being in the trenches. And uh, I tell you what, I believe that's a good uh, description of it. So, number one, knowing God. How do we know God? You've heard, and I'm sure that George has used this before because I probably got it from you, brother. But uh, the fellow that uh, was doubting and uh, that God created everything, uh, he'd gone to college, and he, he came back home from college. He was walking around on the farm with his grandfather, and he said, Grandpa, you really think God made everything? And his grandpa said, I sure do. And as he walked on the edge of the field, he pointed to a watermelon and said, Look at that little spindly vine, and you got this giant watermelon on it. Does that make sense? And grandpa, look at that large oak tree up there big trunk of a tree with a small acorn in it. Does that make sense? About that time, an acorn came falling through the tree and hit the boy in the head, and his grandpa said, aren't you glad that God didn't put watermelons in the trees? <laughs> uh, doubt. You take the doubt and turn that into understanding design and creation, the D out of doubt. The O is for orderliness in creation. The U for the unity of creation. The B for the beauty of creation. The T for the timelessness of creation. And we do see God. We know God. Romans chapter 1 and other scriptures through creation. But there's another way that we know God. And that is through the revelation of scripture. And uh, I love the fact that it is a progressive revelation. I get excited when I open uh, Scripture, for example, the book of Ezekiel, and, uh, and that little word, K-N-O-W, knowing God, comes up more in Ezekiel than the other prophets, and it comes up in the Gospel of John more than any other place in the New Testament. We are to know God. I love the bookends, the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew 1.23, that, you know, Manuel, God with us. And then in 1820, when two or three gathered in my name, there I am I in your midst. And brothers and sisters, this is in the context of uh, doing leadership in 1820. And then in the last chapter, of course, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Transformational leaders also know Christ personally. We understand and we appreciate the lordship of Jesus Christ. He cannot be our Savior if he's not our Lord. And when leaders understand that, we lead accordingly. So, Paul applied biblical teaching, the revelation of the Word of God, to difficulties. Paul was a man who stayed close to God. I, uh, as I read the Old Testament, I notice, and, and you do too, a, a lot of the Old Testament is narrative. M much of it is historical narrative. And, and so, we're talking about the indicative or descriptive. We have long sections of the indicative in the Old Testament. And then all of a sudden we will have the imperative. Just boom, it hits us right there. 
So God is saying, you know this about me and that about me and this about me. Now this is what that means. You must obey me. So I read, in, uh, for example, in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 4, and I love this scripture. Uh, Moses is preaching about what God expects, what God has done. And in chapter 4 and verse 32, For ask now of the days that are past, which were before you, since the day that God created man on earth, and ask from one end of heaven to another, whether such a great thing as this has ever happened or ever heard of. Did any people ever hear the voice of a God speaking out of the midst of a fire, as you have heard, and still live? Or has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself? from the midst of another nation, by trials, by signs, by wonders, and by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great deeds of terror, all which the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides Him. Out of heaven He let you hear His voice, that He might discipline you. And on earth he let you see his great fire, and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them and brought you out of Egypt uh, with his own presence by his great power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than yourselves to bring you in, to give you their land for an inheritance in it, uh, as it is this day. Know, K-N-O-W, know this, know therefore today and lay it up in your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. Amen? Even Nebuchadnezzar, after going in, uh, insane, when he came back to his senses, he understood that God was the, God of, the only God of heaven and he was also the God of earth. Therefore, you, this is the therefore, There's always a catch. Paul does that to us quite a bit, doesn't he? But here, therefore, you shall keep his statutes and commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land of the Lord your God that he has given you for all time. That's just one example. Over and over and over. Leaders, we we need to know ourselves. And... If you're an elder in the church, preachers, hey, I, I, I've been a preacher, so I can criticize preachers too. I, and this is my feeling. The majority of our preachers do not stay in the Word as much as they ought to. I, I, listen, and sometimes that's their own fault, poor habits. But sometimes it's because they're doing, every, doing everything in the church when they ought not to be. And I remember, I can't remember who preached a sermon about we are to be ministers of the Word and uh, preach the Word, study the Word. Some call it the hard chow work, getting ready to preach a sermon. And that's what it really is. The easy part is getting up and doing it. It's getting ready for it. And uh, too many of you, and elders too, uh, you guys don't rely on the preacher to know the Word. The Word is for every member of the church, every single one of us, not just the elders, not just the preacher. We have the Word of God. What a wonderful gift to have the Holy Word of God that we can study and apply to our lives, that we can build around our marriages and our children, our jobs, our plans, our hope. And we don't have to worry about change in America happening inside the beltway. It'll happen in the pulpit and in the pew because we will be living with God, walking with God, the God of heaven and earth. When you really understand that, when it really begins to sink in, you're a different person. You're a changed person. Joshua. Remember Moses, uh, when he was called, he made excuses? You know, and by the way, all of us have made excuses, haven't we? Stop making excuses when it comes to time, quality time in the Word of God. I remember... The story about the sergeant had seven men who were still out. It was Monday morning at 7.15. They were supposed to be that 0700 for muster, and none of the seven had shown up. And finally, one of them comes straggling in 15 minutes later, and the sergeant says, where have you been, son? He says, sir, I am sorry to be late. I I had a great date last night, Sunday night, and he said, "Uh, I had such a great time, I missed my bus. So after I missed the bus, I had to call a cab. 
I got in the cab, cab broke down. So I had to walk to a farm, borrow a farmer's horse, rode the horse, the horse dropped dead. So I had to walk the rest of the way in. A few minutes later, a second guy comes in, Sarge, and says, where have you been? He says, Sarge, I'm sorry. I had a great date. I forgot my bus. I called the cab, got in the cab, cab broke down. I had to get out of the cab, walk to a farm, borrow a horse, rode the horse, the horse dropped dead on the way in. Now, third guy comes, you want me to go through this again? No, I'm not going to do that. Last guy walks in. Last guy walks in and says, Sarge says, okay, where have you been? He says, Sarge, I am sorry. I had a great date last night. I, I missed the bus. And the Sarge interrupted him and says, I know. You caught a cab and the cab broke down. He said, oh, no, cab didn't break down. We had a driver and all them dead horses coming in here. <laughs> hey, that's pretty ridiculous. That's not, but it's not as silly as Aaron, the brother Moses, saying, I don't know. We just threw it all in there and this calf came out. You see, our own excuses do seem so well-informed and intelligent, but some of them are just about as ridiculous as that. We need to stop making excuses. Moses, who was a, a, a slow to follow God, afraid to follow God, became a great leader because he grew closer to God. And he saw the work of God. He appreciated God. And therefore, when Joshua's time came, Moses, because he was a transformational leader, listen to this, Moses was able to show courage, uh, uh, conviction and courage, and lead uh, 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 Joshua to becoming a man of God, a great leader. As a matter of fact, four times, four times in Joshua chapter 1, God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. And then he says in verse 7 of chapter 1, only be strong and courageous. And then God says a third time in chapter 1, verse 9, be strong and courageous. And then a fourth time, they haven't gotten it yet, <laughs> only be strong and courageous. And would you agree with me that Joshua was a man who was strong and courageous? You know why? He was close to God. Leaders get closer to God. Now, knowing yourself, I love the Psalms, and, uh, and I... I think that emotions are a part of our faith, but they do come exactly as George has laid it out. Our emotions are not to guide us. They're these wonderful feelings we can come, that come from knowing God and obeying God. Amen? The feeling that we get is wonderful in a relationship with God. God made us to be people, creatures that feel and laugh. Uh, you've got to be able to laugh. I mean, if you have a brother like David, you end up laughing a lot. And I do love my little brother, David. He's, he's, he, <laughs> he's, I got to go home with him, so I can't say a whole lot. <laughs> but I love the Psalms, the laments in the Psalms. When, uh, Psalms thir uh, Psalm 13 is one of my favorites because David starts off, you know, Lord, where are you? And he felt like his prayers weren't being heard. And often from David, we find out about his frailness and his fears and his own failures. God gives.